uh, 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 spread them amongst your your colleagues, uh, etc. And and then just to uh, uh, introduce our speaker today. So it's it's, very, it's a real pleasure to welcome David Moreno Mateus, who's just uh, joined this department as an associate uh, professor in, in, uh, in uh, ecology. Uh, and uh, uh, David uh, David got his PhD from from Spain. Then he did a variety of postdoctoral fellowships in Berkeley, in Stanford, and CNRS in France, and has been a research fellow at the uh, Bath Center for Climate Change. And the last few years, he was uh, an associate professor at Harvard University, and then decided to come somewhere better, and, and, and has joined <laughs> us uh, uh, joined us here uh, this week. So I'm sure he's keen to chat to you and get to know people in the Oxford community. He's just new; just been here a few weeks as well. So this was a great chance for him to to introduce himself and, and his work uh, uh, to this community. So uh, thank you, and over to you, David. Thank you, Javinder. So yes, definitely, I came in like three weeks ago and it's been intense three weeks. I finally got my second kid admitted into school today after three weeks of work. So it's been a great day, finally. <laughs> Some of you know about that, it's been a long history, fun story, So, but it's good. So I'm very happy to be here. I mean, everything has been good so far, except for the school part, which has been very intense. And and basically, I came here trying to also. I actually, when I applied to this position, I never knew. I didn't know about the new Leverhulme Center of Native Recovery, and was actually when I was here interviewing, when I realized that that center existed, it was like, I know, this is amazing. It was an incredible news for me to see there is an actual whole bunch of people interested in trying to understand how nature is recovering, how to restore ecosystems. And which is basically what I do. Basically, I try to understand how ecosystems, let's say how ecosystems respond to the abandonment of an impact, mostly agriculture, but not necessarily. So we'll be looking at also mining and logging occasionally. And an impact starts when people arrive to a place where there was not people or the amount of people had a very different use of the land, as is the case of the Norse arriving to Greenland. So Greenland has been populated for 4,000 years by different versions of the whole, the kind of widely known Inuit community, there was like uh, several arrivals. But then in 1998, this is the depiction of uh, artist in the mid 19th century, how he envisioned the Norse actually the day they arrived with Eric the Red leading the expedition to Southern Greenland, where they created a few settlements and in the, in the Southern part, as you can see here, and there were in total, I think it was 3,000 people in the peak of the community. And they basically were farmers. So Norse basically grew hay for the cattle in the winter, because the winters are very rough, as you can imagine in, in Greenland. Those days were incredibly worse than they are now. And they basically grew hay in places like this. As you can probably see, this is the landscape of Greenland. If you in and you probably have noticed that is this kind of strange path that you can see today. This is actually when we were visiting Greenland a few years ago. These are our tents, as you can see here. And this is a hayfield. So even today, we are talking about 600, depends on the farm, 600 to 1,000 years later, you just visually see the legacy of this farmer agriculture. So this is more or less the size of the field. And here are the ruins of the place where the Norse, the family, usually they were like family communities, usually extended family communities. And this is where used to live. So this is the kind of places that are incredibly interesting for me because there are places where you go, there's been an impact of, let's say an intense impact. So you were here like probably 600 years ago, there were like a lot less vegetation, but it was a place where there's been an impact for a certain period, in this case for, for 450 years, and then that place has been abandoned for whatever historical reason. And then no one else has lived there, there, there afterwards, which is incredibly unusual in a population, in a place where a population is dramatically increasing. So there's a few places on earth where this is happening, and Greenland is one of those. And that's why we decided to go to Greenland. So here, what we basically do is trying to understand how these ecosystems have changed through time. So since the abandonment of this impact. And we are looking into that trying to understand not and um, trying to understand change in a more complex perspective in a more ecosystem perspective so in the way that we are looking at parameters that involve a high amount of complexity i'll go back to this complexity moment in a min, 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 minute but we in a, in a also in an environment that is changing so all these systems are not going to be 
are never going to be what they used to be. So it's going to be something else. But having an idea of how this drives us to those new situations can be incredibly useful to assess ecosystem recovery and also to inform restoration, which in the end, that's what we want to do. So in the talk today, we're going to be briefly going through four main issues. So the first thing we're going to be talking about global ecosystem recovery patterns uh, that have been happening. I was glad to see, to hear Dalvin there, there is a whole line of people who is, who is going to be talking about ecosystem recovery. And, and in those, then we will explore measures of ecosystem recovery, in particular, those measures that involve this complexity. I'm going to stop for a moment in these two concepts, the concept of recovery and the concept of complexity, because they are perceived very differently from, from different people. So by recovery, I mean, when you have an ecosystem, uh, someone gets there, let's say they, it creates a wheat field, and then that wheat field becomes no longer interesting. After 300 or 3,000 years, some places in Spain, in Europe, have really long-term histories of agriculture, and, the, and then the system kind of recovers. Basically, it doesn't really recover because it doesn't go back to what it was. It basically changes to something. But my interest is trying to see how that system gets to a point where biodiversity loss and ecosystem function loss is no longer happening, basically. So it's a new system of this kind of some kind of dynamic stability. By the way, the system is self-sustaining and is not kind of accumulating a loss of biodiversity and ecosystem function. And the, complex, the concept of complexity, I actually started using this concept of complexity when I was reading, I don't know, years ago, a paper on, on complex system theory was, and that they defined complexity as the amount of information that an algorithm has that does something. So the more information the algorithm has, the more complex is the algorithm according to the complex system theory. And I said, this is actually very useful for ecology. So I understand complexity as those metrics that are encapsulating a lot of ecological information, basically. And to do that, you can do that in very creative ways. You can do it in any, pretty much any way. Usually, well, traditionally in, in ecology, when you are looking at complexity in ecosystems, you usually refer to networks in many cases. And in, ne in ecological networks, complexity is basically driven, is basically related to the amount of interactions that are happening in the ecosystem. And hopefully, in my view, I add also what are the functions that are related to those interactions, how those functions change depending on the structure and the nature of those interactions. And this is from an ecological, let's say, a community perspective, but also from a population perspective in an ecosystem, I understand complexity as the amount of, let's say, genetic information that exists on that on one population that is making that population to have to be to have higher or lower adaptive pot adaptive potential, which is how would or were, how better or worse this population will respond to change, basically. So those are the two levels of complexity what we are uh, looking at, and we'll be going through both of them in a moment. So finally, we are going to walk through two of the field works cases that we have, the Greenland that we already saw, and another one in, in the central Amazon, where there was another kind of people that lived there for many years, and they left many, plenty of agricultural lands abandoned. And they range between 400 to 2,000 years. Well, actually go all the way to 6,500 years old. But I'm going to be focusing on this kind of more recent former agricultural areas. And then finally, we look into a couple of potential applications of all these, let's say, theory or all these observations that we are getting in the field, how that can be translated to actual restoration actions, basically. So the first thing is trying to understand how recovery is happening globally. I mean, this is not, I mean, I'm not going to talk about global recovery patterns because that there are probably a few talks coming in soon that are going to be talking about that. But I'm just going to give you a sense of the global recovery patterns that are happening today. This is a map of basically uh, um, how farmland has been changing over the last 60 years. As you can see, the orange is basically no change. The blue is basically an increase in farmland. The red is a loss in farmland. The purple is just a mix and clear trend. As you can quickly see, most of the loss of farmland is happening in the Northern Hemisphere. Most of the gain in farm is happening in the Southern Hemisphere, which is kind of reasonable. That's what we basically hear in the news with all the deforestation in the tropics happening all the time. 
And but for me, the interesting part is that there's been a 19% abandonment of the farmlands, farmlands in the last 60 years. And that is, is a massive amount of land that naturally, without doing much, is already recovering by itself. So if you overlap the forest change map, which is from the same study, it's basically showing us the picture that forests also having like their own unique trends. Again, green is no change, blue is more forest, and red is less forest. Again, you have more forest, a net gain in forest in the northern hemisphere, uh, and a net loss of forest in the in the tropics mostly. So these two maps, they are not, I mean, they don't completely overlap, but they are telling you two main trends that are related and highly connected, but not exactly the same in terms of the data that they are showing. So it's like we have an, a loss of agricultural land and a gain in forest cover. So there is actually a huge opportunity to promote this forest recovery and this farm and abandonment and use it also, I mean, also through the means of active restoration, not only like just abandoning land, which in many cases is probably the best because we don't really know a lot on how to restore ecosystems. So, and so the idea basically is trying to see how restoration can be improved in all this land, basically in the future, also responding to all these calls on ecosystem restoration that are happening globally. So with this goal, we did our first study trying to assess globally how restoration has been doing. So I'm gonna walk through this graph because we're gonna have different versions throughout the talk. Um, so this is any metric of an ecosystem going back to these simple ways to measure change, which is through biodiversity or soil carbon in the soils. This is time. So this is the measure of that metric. So then at some point, this trend starts. Then that lasts for some time, this metric goes down or changes. I mean, doesn't matter. And then this turbulence ends, and then this thing basically recovers to something that was similar to what you had before. So this recovery debt concept that we coined is basically this area, the pale area, is basically the area between what it used to be and the area that what it's been, what it has been doing the recovery process. And the dark part is basically what we were able to gather in our study. Because I mean it's this the whole area is really hard to get. So you just get pieces of it. So in general, when, when we compile data from like, like over 3,000 restored and recovering ecosystems, we found that on average, usually restored ecosystems have half of the animals and plants in general, let's say let's half of the density of the animals and plants. They were 30% less diverse and they were 40% less functional, specifically focused on, the, on carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus uh, cycling. So, um, so, and the... Even more interesting thing for me was that this pattern was incredibly consistent across, across biomes. So it doesn't matter if it's a forest, a marine ecosystem, or a, or a river. There is always this more or less similar decrease in ecosystem, I mean, in, in the abundance of organisms in general and the diversity. And, and in this case, the data weren't incredibly good for what I would have liked to do, which is we would, I would have liked to see how that change happens in time. And we were only able to collect some data on the time. So you can see, I think the average time for this recovery period is 22 years, which as you can imagine from an ecological perspective is pretty much like the very, very start of the process. So the next thing we wanted to do is to see, okay, let's try to reconstruct recovery trajectories. So how this is gonna actually, this is changing to time. This is what I'm, we're finishing right now. This is um, our paper we are hoping to submit anytime soon. So this is basically the same graph. So we have time and we have a metric of, uh, of an ecosystem that is recovering. So this is the reference. So let's say the, the closest it is to the reference, the, the more recover it is. And we just gather data for abundance, diversity, species similarity, and then the uh, carbon cycling and nitrogen and phosphorus stocks in soils, only because it's the only data for which you have enough amount in the literature to be able to get Kind of some consistent uh, database, as you can see. Uh, are they recovering from agriculture or uh, they... agricultural logging? Yes, only so we eliminated any other impact. So to make it consistent, in the end, I, I wasn't trying to say it, but in the end, there was no difference in the recovery patterns from a statistical perspective between logging and agriculture, which is surprising. Well, there was minor effects, but anyways. So the thing is that, as you can see, 
I'm all sorry, I forgot to mention all these kind of pale lines in the bottom are the actual chrono sequences that were shown in these in these studies. We got, I mean, for those of, no, of you who don't know what is a chrono sequence, it's basically a series of plots in an ecosystem that have been abandoned at different times in history. So for instance, you have a plot that was abandoned 50 years, another one 100 years, and another one 150 years. And then you imagine that you have a reference uh, that, that this is still being, let's say, impacted. So you, with that, you build this reference, this kind of sequence, and then you compare that against a reference, which is commonly a forest that has been, let's say, hope ideally not disturbed, but that doesn't really exist, but let's say with a lot less disturbance, or at least for the last few hundreds of years. So this would be an undisturbed, unquote, ecosystem. So the question is, Every metric recovers in very different ways. Basically, the main trends are basically statistical models of like an conglomerated uh, chrono sequences. And you can see some metrics recover kind of, let's say, quickly. We are talking about 150 years for these metrics. We are talking about 300 years for the abundance of some species. But other species, other metrics like the species similarity is taking a lot longer. So species similarity is a tricky metric because you are hoping to have the same species that you had before, which is very hard to happen. But it, as you can see, it kind of tends to happen in some way. So it gives us some information on ecosystem say. So the predictions, basically, I mean, if you cut this, this, uh, this, this slice on the 50 years to give you a sense of how recovery operates, you can see that pretty much every single point that we had in our, data, in our database were, was well below the 100%. So this is basically telling you that 50 years is just at the very beginning of the recovery process. So the question now is what is going to happen in the future with these metrics of recovery? And what is going to happen also when the environment is changing so dramatically, so we don't really know where we are going. And that's the next step of the research that we want to do is we want to know we're going to develop some tools to try to predict these recovery trajectories based on current changes in different parameters, that environmental parameters. So <clears throat> the thing is also, I mean, this, this uh, time scale is not, I mean, it's, I try to make it accurately. So what we are finding when we try to estimate this, we are looking at periods of time which are really long. So for instance, we are finding that to recover the abundance in, in the forests, we are talking about, in our parameters, talk, uh, time scales of 400 years at the least. So the thing is, it gives you a sense of the, of the time scale of recovery. But we're going to go well beyond that a little later in, in the presentation. And in reality, it take, you think that it, recovery takes a long time, but I mean, it's not surprising because, I mean, think about a forest like this one. This is the highlands of Costa Rica. These are oaks, most of them. And uh, this tree has like something between 400 and 500 years. And you can see the huge complexity of the system just by looking at it. And then one kind of company, logging company comes here and then it locks it and overnight, literally overnight, you can have a place like this. So thinking that you can go back easily to that state, I mean, it's, I mean, it's clearly not possible basically in a very long time. So the question is, as we increase this degradation, this, let's say, this uh, loss of complexity, forests are actually changing. So this study were showing a couple of years ago how global forests are changing. So this is basically a depiction of a chrono sequence. So you have an old growth that for whatever reason is recovering. But the thing is that in, during this recovery process, there are many factors like pushing, putting stress on the system. And they were looking specifically at changes in temperature, droughts, land use change, wildfire and insect outbreaks. The thing is that through time, these forests, the new forests, are just different forests. And they found specifically that these new forests were younger in general and shorter, literally. So that's an interesting point. The thing is that overall, we are getting younger forests, globally speaking. And, but the thing is that to, to understand the deeper, because they were looking at, let's say, like broad scale, high profile ecosystem, I mean, metrics. But looking at the deeper kind of a structure of the ecosystem is what really is interesting for me, because that's what is going to be hard to re recover. This graph that probably some of you have seen is basically the first idea of how the 
complexity of a forest is built. I mean, it is it's, it's actually very simple if even it looks complicated. So this is a 50 by 50 plot in Washington state. And they were these are Douglas firs, and these dot, the black dots are sampling points. And each of these weird shapes are fungal genets. For those of you who know who doesn't know what a fungal genet is, basically let's say individuals that spread throughout the floor of the forest. Each of these links is the connection between one tree and one of these fungal genets. And, and there are trees like this one that they, they call uh, the mother trees were connected through this mycelial network to 32 other trees within the forest. So the thing is that we are looking at one species of trees and just two species of mycorrhizal fungi from the genus, uh, from the genus Rithopagon. And the crazy thing is that this is the incredibly simplified version of a forest. You should think that you, you would have like, I don't know, an average of three, two, eight species of trees, uh, probably a few dozens of understory species and grasses, and then hundreds. So an average for temperate forests have between something between 80 to 100 ectomycorrhizal fun species, fungi species only. And then you need to add all the other fungal species. So the thing, the picture of complexity is just, is just crazy. So if you go to a place like this and you log it, that you convert it in agriculture, how long is it going to take to recover something, some complexity like that? And that complexity have specific gives the system specific features that makes that ecosystem that ecosystem and not a very simplified version of it. So under this kind of paradigm, we have a couple of questions. The first, which is the trickiest one, is how do you measure change? I was interested in hearing that some speaker is coming to talk about the holy grail in biodiversity metrics, which I'm so interested in seeing because I don't know how to do it. I'm just exploring things that I think are complex, but in reality, they're incredibly simple. So we are basically trying to look at the structure of the interactions like this one here and try to bring it a little kind of bigger. So more species to have a sense more on how things are, how things interact in this, and how those interactions, as I mentioned, produce the functions of the ecosystem. And then from this population level that we, I mentioned before, we also want to know how once you want the let's say the end the impact ends and how the population respond to that end so as you will see in a moment as you have i mean you put pressures on ecosystems there is a selective pressure on the genomes of those of those populations that are also eroding in most of the cases the genetic diversity and that genetic diversity will have an effect mostly decreasing the potential i mean the adaptive potential of of those populations and that is also the other question that we're going to see, is it how those genomes recover as the system, as the, the pressure is, is, is released. The second question is, how long does it take this, all this whole process? Which is, again, a question which we have literally no idea. And, well, we are starting to have some sense of the magnitude of the, of the, of the, of the issue. So to respond to these questions, we have a few hypotheses that we are trying to test. The first one is basically that the is the response of these more complex metrics, run the response of biodiversity metrics to the recovery process and the also the effect under environmental and there and and the also the process of environmental change, which is going to be having the most effect in ecosystem functions. And that's something that we're going to test using a couple of sites. This is the example we have for our Greenland project. And testing this is, is complicated because you need an ecological layer of information, but you also need an historical layer of information. And that the tricky one is, I mean, as ecologists, we are very bad at reconstructing the history of places because we don't know how to do it. So that's why I merged disciplines, as I mentioned in this in this plot. So this is this is, let's say, I would be like me talking about how ecosystems recover. This is the same graph we had before. This is time, this is a metric of recovery. This is the reference state and metrics, as we saw, respond in different ways. Some, some metrics recover quickly, like spatial richness, and others may recover a lot more slowly, like interaction, the structure of interactions. And this is the chrono sequence. So you have, well, actually, this is the chrono sequence. This would be the reference, uh, the historic ecosystem. This is the, let's say, degraded ecosystem, and this is the recovering ecosystem. But the thing is to build a land history here is where you need to team up with others, people from mostly in social science. And so for instance, in the Greenland project, we are teaming up with, with archeologists 
because they can tell us what happened in the land because we just don't know. So based on their archeological methods, mostly using carbon 14 and other issues, another method we can understand what happened so and what happened means when these people arrived for how long they were what did they do in the land and when they died when Greenland actually they died in other places they just left and reconstructing reconstructing that land history is, is very difficult we are trying to do this we've been trying to do this also in New England in another sequence of re forest recovery that has been happening there but I'm not going to get into that and that's what we have been teaming up with environmental historians because again it's like it's it's so difficult. The, the, the thing is that since this is happening under environmentally changing conditions, how do you control for that? Tricky part for which I have not a clear response. What we are trying now is also teaming up with paleolimnologists to reconstruct the response of the ecosystems to past climate changes and see if with that we can have a sense of how we can expect the system to respond in the future. And then the last part, as I mentioned before, is try to see what's going to happen in the future. And here's where we're going to be using, this is not happening yet, will happen soon, looking at what we call the recovery probabilities, which is basically what are the chances that one metric follows a certain trajectory under certain environmental conditions in the future. And this is what I team up with my theoretical ecologist colleagues ben, to, to predict. So this is basically the picture that we are trying to address to kind of used to, to test our first hypothesis. And in these systems, what we are doing more specifically, so where's the field work here? So the field work is basically going to, to the recovery ecosystem, sampling the plant community and the soil microbial community. And it, uh, this is my, let's say, simple approach to complexity, to understand the complexity, which, because ideally you need to sample like many more things, but for now we are starting, let's say, with that. So specifically, we're looking at a whole array of organisms that are interacting with the tree, which are like mycorrhizal fungi that have mutualistic um, interactions, but also the opposite, pathogenic fungi, but also uh, bacteria that interact with the fungi in different ways, and then other organisms that are also feeding on these bacteria and fungi. And this guy gives us a little bit of a sense of how the, the system underground is actually uh, affecting the system uh, above ground. So with this idea, there was this study that I want to share with you a few years ago that was trying to understand how complexity is related to function. These guys from the Netherlands were uh, looking at these three meadows uh, that were abandoned one year, 15 years, and 30 years before the study started. They basically do the uh, high throughput sequencing, basically what is in the soil, like everything. And those are, all these are groups of organisms in the soil. For instance, all these are bacteria, the red ones, and these blue ones are fungi. And so they were, these are co-occurrence networks. We can have a whole discussion about that, but I'm just gonna give you the idea of what these people found. And they was basically seeing how many links and how strong were they links through time. And they found that through time, as you can see, there were more links, but it was more interesting because in the later stages, there were more strong links. And that was giving these networks a higher and lower vulnerability to secondary extinctions, which basically they were more resilient to change. But not also that, they also found that these networks were more efficient in using carbon because there was a transition from a bacterial dominance to a fungal dominance and fungi are more efficient in using carbon than ba our bacteria. So for me, this is the first very clear and it hasn't been repeated in that sense, I think in other places or a larger scale, which is one of the things I'm trying to do in a, that how high more complex systems are more functional or LA, let's say they are more efficient in using uh, resources, resources, sorry. So the next question is, is this something that happened in this meadow or is this something that maybe happened in other places? And this basically drives us to our second hypothesis, which is basically trying to see if there are species, what we call meta-community hubs, I go back, to back, I go back to this in a minute, that are showing similar traits throughout kind of, let's say, a latitudinal gradient. So there are global patterns of ecosystem recovery. So if those traits are consistent or at least kinds of traits are consistent, 
we can actually use that for, for restoration. That's kind of the goal of this, of this idea. And meta community hubs uh, are basically what we call those species that have unusual important roles in the recovery process. And that's exactly the kinds of species that we're gonna find for restoration. So uh, these are basically the three projects that we have ongoing in the field. Uh, hopefully at one day will be comparable. For now, we are just working independently in each of them, trying to get kind of mm, consistent data. And the second, I mean, the, the, the issue with this approach is that since the environment is changing very quickly, especially temperature is changing, mostly rising, and these drivers are having very different kinds of effects in this recovery process. So what we are kind of hypothesizing is that, for instance, temperature will have like two opposing effects. So on one side, temperature accelerates processes, specifically biogeochemical process. But in the opposite way, temperature also increases metabolic rates. And by increasing metabolic rates, in most of the cases, meta high metabolic rates include more pathogenic interactions and less in mutualistic interactions. So in reality, it's having one positive effect and another potentially negative effect that we don't know what's going to be the outcome. This is basically a hypothesis that we would like to test at some point. And this is from the community perspective. And the next step, as I mentioned before, is what's going to happen with the genomes of the populations that are part of those ecosystems. And this hypothesis is based on, on basically an assumption that is, was supported a few years ago from this graph. So this graph was a paper, that, a paper that was showing the global map of genetic diversity. So what these people found is that in this gradient of disturbance, so this is more disturbance, less disturbance, there was an increase in genetic diversity, except for the dense settlements, which is basically like enough urban areas in most of the cases, which are highly manipulated by people and increase, let's say, is an artifact of human manipulation. When you have, a, we do not have that effect, then there is a real increase in genetic diversity. So my hypothesis is what happens if we leave, stop this pressure, these disturbances. They are, my hypothesis is that it would actually recover all the genetic diversity. And genetic diversity in itself may not tell us a lot, but genetic diversity is what is actually allowing the species to have more chances to cope with change, basically, which is what we call um, the adaptive potential, all, ev all evolutionary potential. So we are assuming that as genomes recover, the species have more chances to adapt to, to change, basically. So with these three hypotheses in mind, uh, we're gonna go to the field and see how we are trying to test them, specifically the hypothesis one and three. The one is this, uh, this the interactions hypothesis, the complexity hypothesis, and then the adaptive potential hypothesis. So the first is Greenland, as you, as this is the, um, the we visited Greenland um, a couple of times and we just go to these Norse farms and we sample the plants, I mean the roots of the plants and see who is there, basically trying to see, trying to build these networks. If you go to classic environmental and classic monitoring parameters like biodiversity, you quickly see that the amount of the local pool of species is pretty much the same, actually, the species composition is actually not very different. But if you look at little, deep, but you can see, I mean, visually, again, it's, it's amazing. It's really interesting to see how this field was abandoned, I don't know, 700 years ago, and it's still incredibly different from the surrounding environment. And this is mostly due to agricultural legacies. So in degraded, let's say in post-agricultural areas, you would have a lot more nitrogen and phosphorus than in the places that were not farmed. And we're talking about like five times more uh, nitrogen and almost three times more, more phosphorus. So and this has an impact, a legacy, basically, a legacy impact in these populations that we, that we saw, but it also has a functional effect. So when we, in these roots, what we basically did, we sequenced the, the roots to see what is the DNA that was uh, present from the uh, fungal communities. In this case, this is basically like a preliminary uh, these are preliminary results. So what we found is that in places that were disturbed by the Norse, there was a switch from more mutualistic interactions to more pathogenic interactions, as you can see here and here. So the human use of land has basically increased the pathogen interactions. 
and the pathogenic interactions, sorry. And this basically links what uh, the theory and uh, the hypothesis, which uh, the mutualist mutualism melt, oh, I have a hard time saying it, sorry. Mutualism meltdown hypothesis that states that disturbed ecosystems have less mutualism and more pathogenism. And the thing is that pattern has been found in many places. So we found the same kind of thing. So the idea is like, okay, if these places, if through time this would go back to some to the same amount of mutualism, certainly not probably the same species or similar amount of, of pathogens. So when we looked a little deeper into the interaction, the structure of the interactions themselves, we came up with these networks. So this is the plant community. So the larger the size of the block is the more abundant the species in each of the blocks that we sampled. And this is the fungal community. Again, only fungal community, no other microbes for now. And each of these are basically, let's say the operational, uh, the species of the fungi. As you can see, in the stored ecosystems, we have like literally half of the species of fungal species. But we saw that the community, the plant community was exactly the same. So this effect, you would only see it if you dig deeper into the structure of the ecosystem. And these networks, as because they were having a lot less fungal species, they were having a lot less inter interactions, basically what would you mention here links. So basically in the end, these networks end up being a lot more vulnerable to further extinctions. So their ability to respond to change decreases. So the next question that we're gonna do in this project and other projects is trying to see what are the species that are having these key ecological roles, key functional roles, the species that we call the meta-community hubs. But for that, we need to do many more analysis. So still, we don't know which are the, those species because those are the species that we could understand we could use in, in ecosystem restoration in the Arctic or elsewhere. I mean, not because the same species in the Arctic you could use elsewhere, the traits that hopefully will be consistent could be used, found in other species elsewhere, which is basically where I was trying to show with, with, this, with this graph here. So <laughs> now we are gonna go to the second place where we are doing, trying to test our hypothesis which is in the central Amazon, not far from Manaus. So in the Amazon, you probably know that the, I mean, the, land, the land use history has been incredibly intense over the last many hundreds of years. And so over the last few, probably two, three decades, more three decades, it's been debated how it was there and the, the intensity of the land use. But honestly, when I was there, we were sampling many places across the, 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 on the shore of the Amazon and many other tributaries. And in every single place we stopped, we saw the legacy of agricultural uses. And we are talking about primary forests with trees that are 500 years old. So there was a legacy that was coming before those 500 years and still you can find it in, in the ground. That was really amazing. And this is what you find. So when you dig a hole anywhere in this, in most of the shorelines, in pretty much most of the Amazon, you find this this black upper part, which is what they call Terra Preta do Indio, which is basically a legacy of ancient agriculture, which basically involves more organic matter, uh, very specific kinds of uh, organic molecules that you wouldn't find in the rest of the forest that are a legacy of agriculture, more phosphorus and more calcium. So, and the thing is that this system is self-sustainable. In some way, it's got to a point where the system perpetuates itself in this Terra Preta dark mode so it doesn't go back to the system you had before so it's incredibly interesting but i'm not going to into that not going to get into that because here in these places what we are now interested is in looking in at initially again preliminary results one species which is the brazil nut this is the fresh nut which is incredibly tasty way more tasty than the ones you find in the in the in the supermarket and this 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 fruit body is like this big more or less it's heavy it's like two kilograms of stuff and it gets like 20 to 30 different seeds and they are incredibly uh, uh, incredibly nutritious for many reasons so they've been used by pre-columbians pre-columbian peoples for at least eleven thousand years so and it's very artificially by artificial i mean by humanly uh, dispersed 
dispersed by humans throughout the Amazon for over uh, 11,000 years. So the origin of the species was in one very specific place. So all this human dispersion has been put in and used, it's been put in a selective pressure on these species for larger fruits. I mean, the larger, the better. Actually, if you go to the oldest known populations in the Amazon, the fruits are like tiny little things that nobody really cares about. And if you go to the super selective ones, you will look at these incredibly tasty, huge fruits. And why we got Brazil nuts? Because this is one of the most long living species that has ever been cropped in the Amazon. So if you want to see the legacy of something of agriculture, I want to see what are the species that will be the last to recover if you actually want to achieve, let's say, full recovery in some way. So in, in this place, we were uh, sampling Brazil nut trees. As you can see, they are incredibly big, beautiful trees. And, with, and we want to see specifically if we can find, I mean, we were looking at populations that we were, we were hoping to find populations that are showing signs of recovery, of this genomic recovery. So we go to places that there are no history of use at all. And then we go to places where there's been some history of use. And then we try to compare what are the changes. I mean, we don't have a lot of results. The thing, yeah, but I want to show you what we have because this is from this week, actually, that we got the first genomic results. So what we do there is we get tissue from the plant and we do whole genome sequencing, which is basically we sequence the whole genome to see what regions have changed. And that's, that's, a key, that's a, the, the key point, because if we identify what regions have changed, then we can actually annotate those regions and know what is being the change. And the change could be the size of the fruit, but they the, the, the could be also the, 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 um, I mean, the size of the leaf, the, what is the stomatal activity, and many other parameters that is going to tell us how the species itself is changing. And if it's changing in a way that is making it more resilient to change or is making or is got a stock in this selective place that may have happened. So what we have got so far, this sorry, this is the place where we were sampling. So let me so Manaus is right here, just in case I know you have ever been in Amazon. So this is not far from Manaus. This is well, it's not far, it's a four-day boat trip from Manaus, which is Crazy. I mean, the logistics in the Amazon are crazy. And this is the oldest record of human use of Brazil nut 11,000 years ago, which is an incredibly, this, what is it? So somewhere around here is the oldest, I mean, the oldest, the, let's say the um, center of dispersion. I don't know how to say that in English, the center of dispersion of the species, where let's say what the species originated at some point in the history of this species. So, from here, that was the center of origin. This is the last year. So it's been dispersed for a very long time all throughout the Amazon here. So we sampled all these nine locations. So in those locations, we also are trying to rebuild the history of the land using, again, carbon-14. And this is the, actually the time. This is years before present for each of these populations. And the goal here is trying to relate the age of this, uh, I mean, let's say the recovery time but the recovery since abandonment with different genomic parameters. Genetic diversity will be the first. This is what we're doing actually these days. This is a graph from yesterday. So we actually found some clustering in the structure of the populations. Some species, some, one of the, some of the oldest ones have a very different genetic structure than the, than other, of the more recent populations. But we still need to make a lot of work. This is, it was just really interesting to see that yesterday. So there are, there start to be some potential patterns, but still, this is incredibly preliminary. So the question is uh, now look into the genomes and see what's changing. This is what we are also starting to see. So basically, this is our random chromosome. This is basically the position in the chromosome. This is how different populations. I mean, what is, what is the, the, this is basically a metric of genetic diversity, let's say. So how these different, um, the, these different populations are having different differences in their genomes. So for instance, you see this is the, the former uh, yellow population here is having a really unique genetic structure. But also here, you see there is a clear genetic signature that who knows what is coming from, it could be anything, but these place where this genetic signature of this population is kind of going back to the average, 
other populations are taking peaks, meaning that there is a region with this active selection. We don't know exactly what, we'll know at some point, hopefully in a year or so or less, but there is one of these regions that we are interested in seeing how they are changing and in what direction. And then the thing is that you do this for the whole genome. So you get millions of little graphs like this to see uh, what's happening. So, so the, the, then how, my next question is, how is this, how this could be useful for restoration, actually, for the practice of restoration. Because I mean, from this, for me, this has a lot of political implications because the first thing is that if you know that ecosystems take hundreds of years to recover to something that happened before, like let's say current impacts, by current I mean like post-industrial impacts for let's say 300 years, 400 years. So the regulations need to be also adapted to that time scale. So you cannot think that you can disturb an ecosystem and then you're going, because you can restore it. So that is not happening. That is not going to happen in, in many lifetimes. And that's one of the key things that I'm interested in, in, in saying and also has implications because when you see the, the climate decade, no, I mean the climate, the UN decade on ecosystem restoration and how they are understanding restoration, honestly, it drives me crazy thinking that it's just planting millions of trees because it's all about people engagement, which is important, and planting millions of trees, which is an incredibly simplistic way to understand restoration. I know that kind of putting all this complexity into politicians today is not easy. But on the other side, there has to be some middle ground. It's that not just planting trees that getting people involved. It has to be something more, something else. Anyways, I'm not going into politics. I'm going to move on to more practical on the ground applications. So by doing this whole genome sequencing and understanding what are the regions of the genomes that we are interested in, and hoping that whole genome sequencing is going to get incredibly cheaper in the last, in the next probably 10 to 15 years, it's already incredibly cheaper compared to what it was 10 years ago like literally 10 times less. Uh, so it's something that probably anyone can do in the, in the next time, in the, in the near future. So you can just kind of harvest the landscape looking for where are the right populations to source your materials that have the highest chances to, to survive ecosystem, I mean, uh, environmental change. So, and I think that if you combine that selection with the, this, this population selection with the meta community hub approach, which is basically choosing the right species that have key ecological roles in recovery, then you can have like, let's say this super individual, super um, uh, species that will basically accelerate the recovery process and have more chances to survive environmental change. The second application is, is more, is, is really practical. So the idea here is to create these structures, we call it the restoration pods, which basically you combine all the elements you need to build a micro ecosystem. So once you know where the meta community hubs, let's say three species of, of plants, 10 species of fungi and five species of bacteria and whatever, you actually put all these, the propagules of these species, hopefully, this is a lot to say, <laughs> and in, in different compartments. So you have compartments for these propagules, then compartments for nutrients, compartments for organic matter, and then water or ways to get water in a biopolymer that is environmental responsive, you just deploy these th things in the landscape using kind of this, well, any kind of drone approach. And then those things are, we are hoping that they can stay in the landscape like kind of dormant for years. And then once you reach the right environmental conditions, which is moisture and temperature, basically, then they can, they release this, they actually mix the components and then you start this micro ecosystem. It's kind of a wild thing that we are thinking, but actually we are talking with people in environmental engineering and, and trying to see, uh, and actually people that do this biopolymer thing, which is incredibly interesting, that actually we can actually build this biopolymer thing. The thing is how they are going to respond. Well, there are a lot of challenges here, but basically it's like this complexity approach can be basically encapsulated in this, with this device that hopefully at some point will be kind of could be used in the field. I'm going to close down with just a reminder of the main ideas. Basically, the main idea I always like to tell people is that recovery is a very long-term process, much more than we would think. I mean, I mean, if you understand ecology, it's like it's it's a very long-term process. 
and 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 to understand how ecosystems change, we need to look at this to these more complex attributes of the ecosystems. I'm just listing these three because are the ones we've been discussing today. There could be many more. I mean, this is a totally open field for research. So we're talking about interactions. So what is the nature of interactions, the intensity of interactions, and how the structure and all these properties are going to make uh, are going to give you a much better idea of how complexity is changing at the community slash ecosystem level. And then we can also look into some degree of complexity by looking at these whole genomes of the populations that are important for whatever restoration or conservation reasons. And then finally, how we move the, from, how we convert this knowledge into a specific actions that hopefully at some point will be useful is basically using this meta community hub approach that is gonna basically help you choose the right species for restoration but also help to choose the populations of those species that are going to be key for, for restoration. And I think I'm going to leave it here for today. So if you guys have questions, comment. So maybe we can share the slides because I've been seeing people taking Pictures. I don't know if you guys do that or not. Yeah, okay. Yes. Yes. Hold on. I think we need the mic. The mic. Yeah. The, what is yes, it? Yeah. Uh, he was asking, sorry. Thank you. Uh, because you're sequencing, uh, how would you define a population with high adaptive potential compared? between these different sites? Yes, well, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, I would respond to that question at two levels. So the first level is, in principle, high generative diversity gives more chances for the population to respond to more, a wider array of environmental conditions. So by itself, having higher generative diversity could mean higher adaptive potential. But more specifically, I would mostly understand higher adaptive potential if you can identify those regions that have that are related to the ability of the species to adapt more easily to, to environmental change. So not necessarily higher diversity, but it's the, the regions or the functions that are related to their capacity to, to adapt are in the, let's say, have the right, are in the right, uh, have the right structure basically. So for instance, think of uh, if you are looking for a species that are mm, more resistant to drought because increasing temperatures are reducing precipitation. So you wanna find high adaptive potential in that particular case would be a population that have more chances to have, let's say, the ability of, close, the, of closing the stomata more quickly in a reduction of moisture, for instance. And that would be like more specific and more targeted approach to understand adaptive potential. Thank you. Question from a social scientist. Um, is there any evidence that removing human disturbance, for instance, low level disturbance, uh, mowing of alpine meadows um, actually would reduce biodiversity? And what's your thoughts on that? If Oof, I, that's a hard question. I don't really know a lot. I mean, I mean, removing an impact can have completely different impacts in some ways is good. In some ways could increase biodiversity and in some ways could completely decrease biodiversity. And it all depends on the local conditions of the site. And so in the case of alpine meadows, I don't know because I'm sure the response is gonna be very specific to the location where you do that. Because removing the impact of mowing and there is no herbivory or nothing at all, then you are most likely gonna have a completely different ecosystem. I suppose if you remove mowing, but you still have local herbivores, there's gonna be a very different uh, kind of, let's say, changing change process. So I, I, I wouldn't know, honestly. Just wondering, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. You've done an impressive job at looking at a lot of metrics of recovery, but I wonder if maybe you, you don't need to go on with that complexity. You could make life easy for yourself, but just going back to the old fashioned metric, which was a community analysis, like an ordination or a twin span. So you're looking at uh, the species composition and mm -hmm. the proportions. Yes. And you know that's what we've used as a target in restoration in Britain, mm -hmm. just aiming for the original community structure. Yes. No, I think, I mean, that's, I have this one. So that's that's actually 
that's actually a lot better than just looking at number of species or common storage and these kind of more traditional approaches. But the thing with species composition is, is basically that it's, it doesn't give you a sense of how function is changing directly. And I think, and the other thing is that the species that are gonna exist in the new place are most likely gonna be different. Not necessarily meaning that those new species are going to be less the typical generalists that come from all over the place and we have the same meadow all over Britain forever. But still, it's going to be different. So in some way, this complexity approach, it going to go beyond species composition because, and this is a discussion I always have, is like, it's not only about looking at interactions to understand functions. I want to understand exactly what species are having what functions. So taxonomy, for me, it's, it's incredibly important. This is my fight with many ecosystem function, I mean, functional ecologists, because it's like all about functions, even if they are incredibly complex functions. But I agree that taxonomy is incredibly important. So I always argue that let's look at species composition, but also let's look at what is the functional approach of that and how does the species interact in. Hi, thanks for the talk and uh, welcome to the department. Thank you. Um, yeah, I really loved all of the things that you were talking about with the connection with um, the above ground and below ground um, uh, interactions. Um, and I had a question um, uh, which sort of popped up when you showed the sort of large oak trees and then you showed how quickly they can be degraded. I also work in the Amazon uh, area region, so I see it all the time. Um, but it never really, I never really thought about what happens to like, once you say, say, say you don't use fire, um, and you, you remove all the trees, um, that structure and, um, all of the sort of connectors and all of the other species and fungi and things like that, that are still below ground in existence. Um, are they, do they still survive? And if they do, if you replanted fairly quickly after a deforestation event, would they be able to reconnect with the young trees? So, so what I would say it depends on the of the of the on the magnitude of the impact. Mm -hmm. Let's say if you just lock the forest and you just and go and you don't come back ever again in hundreds of years, probably recovery will be incredibly fast. Especially if you have a matrix of surrounding forest, because there will be lots of propagules coming in, and then you it will recover. And and even if you don't burn, I mean, usually in the Amazon, they every single time they burn, so they they do not not burn because basically uh, because that brings like quick yeah. uh, nutrients to the to the soil. And but even if you don't burn, let's say, and you convert it into an agricultural field, and that if you break all this structure of the soil just by plowing the soil once you are breaking the structures that may take a few hundreds of years to recover so the thing is it depends a lot on the on the impact so it's not the same logging and or burning and and or plowing and adding fertilizers so it's a huge array of disparities so in this in the in the global analysis that we did this that was showing these recovery trajectories we were kind of finding still we need to do some more analysis that um forests that were recovering from agriculture were recovering better than forest recovering from logging which was like this is crazy and we did we run different kinds of approaches analytical approaches and it was su surprisingly consistent and we i mean we never will know why this is happening but you can have your own hypothesis and we were thinking that as you log a forest and you extract a lot of resources, the kind of nutrients can decrease. As of, and agriculture may have the, oppo the opposite effect. When you leave a field, there is loads of nitrogen and phosphorus and they may be accelerating the recovery process. I mean, that's a hypothesis that we were not, we are not gonna be able to test, but this is basically to give you an idea that, I mean, the process is incredibly stochastic mm -hmm. in most of the cases. Could this, uh, could this sort of analysis be used like, uh, for the advantage of the argument of selective logging or like you know agroforestry or something like that well, i don't know so how would you use that in, to for selective logging uh well i'm wondering so if, for example if the the trees that are taken out are taken out like in whatever systematic way they they choose um which is what they tend to do in like concessions and things like that in in the amazon 
uh, technically speaking, you'd still have some of the older trees remaining and then the un underground um, system would obviously um, I'd imagine reduce be or less it impacted. Would, yes. yeah and it would but it would be less impacted and mm -hmm. potentially the, the new trees that start to grow would they be able to sort of connect yeah, maybe that? definitely I mean the lower the impact the more chances I would say it has mm -hmm. to recover or at least to recover more quickly but again I, I don't know um, thanks Yes, Holland, I think. Thank you. Uh, very interesting. <laughs> we had a paper last year where we argued that for a site in Borneo, which is logs, that many aspects of ecological function were amplified, in, enhanced by, by the disturbance, and actually then uh, including species abundance because, because there were more nutrients flowing through the system, mm -hmm. more insects. Uh, the more insectivores and is cascading through and so I'm not saying that's general for all logging but that's what we found on, on that particular site right. and but it, building a little bit perhaps on Florida's comment there seem to be some types of disturbance that actually amplify enhance ecological function uh, so right. uh, I'm wondering what, what comes through in your metro analysis when you talk about recovery there's always an implicit assumption there that the optimum state the for these metrics is the final end state that you're going to but for many things, and you see this, I guess, in your carbon and phosphorus cycling, you can actually have amplified mm -hmm. ecological features in that disturbed state. And actually the low disturbance state ends up being a, a regression of some, some, some ecological attributes. I just wonder whether, you, yes. given your meta-analysis, whether you had any thoughts so, or comments on that. Well, we actually, we actually, let's say, we nullified the amplified effect because the amplified effect is also an impact. So that having more species is not necessarily positive. It's just a different ecosystem. So we, we nullified by saying that having, let's say, five more species have the same detrimental effect as having five less species. Because you don't, and there's no argument to say that that's positive. So the, the, the thinking that is positive is basically a human, a mental effort thinking that is positive. It's just different. And so that's why we nullify that effect, because in reality, it's just a different ecosystem. So uh, an ecosystem where there is more nutrients, even if it has more biodiversity or more ecosystem function, in this conceptual idea, it will be still a degraded ecosystem mm -hmm. because it's as degraded as one that has less, but just in another direction. That's how we see that. Yeah. That's why I see that basically. Is 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 that's why I mentioned this recovery concept at the beginning. It's not about recovery; it's about how things change. Mm -hmm. But isn't that sort of perhaps a, a value laden thing as well to say that no disturbance is the ecological perfect state and it's not uh, perfect and, it's just uh, the, end of... the ideal state whereas actually if you look at ecological processes in many cases then the disturbed system may have more ecological functioning than, than the non-disturbed system it, it is it is but that's not necessarily positive that's a, that's the thing it's just a different ecosystem we, if it's good or not we don't know mm. i don't know if it's good or not sounds like a good good one for the drinks <laughs> yes uh, Okay. I think we have maybe one more question or no, I don't know, whatever you guys say. Yeah, thanks. Um, partly following up on Yudvinder's comments but, or um, questions, but well, but first, um, so in the case of Washington State and Douglas fir, uh, my understanding generally in, in many parts of the state, Douglas fir is not considered a climax species and we used to talk about that way. Um, because they tend to be occurring in areas where there's a fair amount of natural disturbance. Mm -hmm. I mean, however you define that fire, wind, or especially fire, I think in there. So, um, sort of in extreme fires over a certain cycle. So I would think that, that how ecosystems respond would vary depending on whether on this sort of natural disturbance pattern. So that's one question. And if you found that, so like, and also that's been a logic with you know, sort of logging um, uh, strategies is that when you need, you know, Douglas fir requires a lot of light, so you need a larger clearance if you want Douglas fir growing back. So I'm just wondering how those kinds of, it, because they have a higher, higher turnover as natural ecosystems. So that's one question is, do these recovery processes partly depend on your natural disturbance regime? But another is also following up on, I think what Yudvinder was saying there is like, I think, Yes, they're all, I mean, using the word recovery, I mean, does seem to have a sort of normative communication that this is 
that this is recovering to a desirable state, but you don't mean it that way. You just mean getting back to where it would be if people were not here. If the ideal world is that people aren't here, then recovery means getting back to a place where people are not there. So those are sort of two different questions. Yes. Yeah. Well, the first question, I mean, that wasn't a recovery study. It was just a, this, uh, these studies and trying to understand kind of mycelial networks and just use it as an example of forest complexity without any relation to to the recovery process and and basically to give an idea that, the, that even those simple ecosystems in with all this looking at these simple attributes there is a lot of complexity going on and definitely these systems are entirely kind of driven by disturbance so disturbance is part of the thing maybe living with fire or with other kind of human disturbances for well not much like fifteen thousand years in or in specific in Washington state. So so that wasn't, I mean, my idea was not to say there is no, there has to be no disturbance. And it's just an example basically of forest complexity. And the recovery question, that's what I was mentioning the, the at the beginning, my clarification about the recovery. It's not that we want a world where there's no people. That makes no sense. But you need I always like to have a reference on how a system would be behaving if they would have like no human impact or at least no heavy human impact because that could teach us how if we need to restore what we need to be looking at if we're going to restore ecosystems that are as resilient as the natural ones we may end up finding that all these natural ecosystems and these two ones respond worse than uh, let's say impacted ecosystems but in reality I, in, in really I, we don't know so the idea is not going back to a, an unpopulated place basically although I think the patterns are showing the land abandonment is going to keep increasing over the next decades. So I think it's what's going to happen with all land, all that land where people is not going to be intensively managing. And agricultural technology is becoming incredibly better by the year. So there's going to be more, less and less land needed. So how I personally envision the future is, is like a lot more land abandoned and, and a lot more land that has much more intense impacts in less surface area let's say well that's that's basic that's a possibility it doesn't have to be that way but that's that's how i see that's what and that's why i think understanding recovery is going to be incredibly important as all this process could potentially happen in the future okay you can wrap up there okay so, uh for those of you here, we had about 30 people online as well. So there's a reasonable online audience as well. Great. Uh, so for those of you here in person, you're welcome to linger and have a drink and an informal chat afterwards. Uh, thanks, Stephen, for setting up other drinks. And uh, and uh, see you all next week for, for EJ mm -hmm. Miller-Gullen seminar. So thank you again, David. Thank you. Thank you, guys.